we are so glad that all of you guys are here. I see a lot of people who looks like I've never been to a Lunch and Learn before. Um, we do these events once a month, and they are in keeping with the Society and Business Lab's overall mission of providing opportunities and support to students, faculty, and the general community who are engaged in the work of using business skills to save the world. And so we have these events every month in which we bring in amazing practitioners from the world of social enterprise who are introducing interesting business models, interesting ways of looking at world problems and deciding how they can use business to change them. And today is, of course, no exception. Um, the Society of Business Lab has a bunch of programs that I hope those of you that are new to it will take the time to visit our website, find out about different ways that we can help you in your goals, whatever they are. Um, we have opportunities for MBA students to receive uh, subsidy for working in the social enterprise over the summer. So I'd encourage any of you who are MBAs and doing an internship this summer to take advantage of that totally free money that we're happy to give you. Um, in addition to that, um, we have an initiative, the Society of Business Fellows Program, and you'll hear from one of our fellows in just a minute. So if you guys know of incoming MBA students to Marshall, who are interested in this field, please encourage them to apply to be a fellow. We also have lots of undergraduate programs. And in the fall, an amazing course taught by our director, Professor Adlai Wertman, on global social entrepreneurship, BAEP 491. If you're an undergrad and you have the room in your schedule, it will be the greatest class you've ever taken, and I'm not exaggerating, so please enroll in it. Um, and then in general, please let me know how we can support you. Our final Lunch and Learn of the year after this one is next month, April 15th. There's a flyer on many of your seats. And it is the Director of Fellows and New Ventures, or something like that, from Ashoka, Mexico, and Latin America. And you guys have probably heard of Ashoka. They're one of the leaders in supporting social entrepreneurs around the world. So I'm thrilled that you guys are here today. I hope you got something to eat. You're welcome to take your cups home with you after this. And um, you're in for a real treat, and I'd like to introduce Molly Larson, who is one of our MBA fellows, who will introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Abby. So as Abby said, uh, my name is Molly Larson. I'm a first year MBA student here. Um, if anyone is here from the Net Impact Bridge program that has not yet met me, please approach me afterwards. I'd love to meet you. Um, but I'm here today to introduce Alan Gershenfeld, who's the chairman of the board for Games for Change. Games for Change is an organization that is doing amazing things using video games to address some of the most pressing issues facing society today, including human rights issues and climate change. This new type of video game works to create a more just and tolerant society. Alan is currently co-founder and managing partner of Eline Ventures, a double bottom line early stage fund focused on empowering individuals, small businesses, and underserved communities to better compete in a global marketplace and popular media which engages people in the critical issues of the day. Before Elang Ventures, Alan spent six years with Activision as Senior Vice President of Activision Studios. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of FilmAid International, Sustainable South Bronx, and on the advisory boards of Scenarios USA, Personal Technology Solutions, and the Sesame Workshop. Without further ado, Mr. Alan Gershenfeld. I'm going to go through a whirlwind, a whole bunch of slides, probably a little bit too fast, but I want to leave time for questions because there's, there's a bunch of different directions the conversation could go, and I want to leave it open for that. Right now, I, I wear, there, there are probably three hats that are relevant, actually probably four hats that are relevant to the conversation. Um, I am chairman of this nonprofit, Games for Change. Uh, we do a big conference every year. Ours is coming up uh, in May, May 24th to 27th. We just got the CTO of the White House, Anish Chopra, to do our keynote. We have a really interesting lineup. Uh, I'm actually, it's interesting you mentioned Eline Ventures. I'm gonna talk about why we're actually not doing Eline Ventures, but Eline Media. And I'm gonna talk about a transition that's recently happened in terms of my day job, my for-profit kind of double bottom line job. And then uh, a number of sort of advisory board and board seats that I'll cover. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I'm gonna start because, because this is not a game-focused crowd, I want to provide a little bit of a framework for why computer and video games are actually a very powerful platform for learning, health, and social impact, and kind of frame the space before I get into a little bit of how I'm approaching the, the space with the company. So, unlike movies or TV or, or books or linear media, 
at the very first level, games are interactive, they're participatory, you lean forward um, when you play games. And, and I think that's unique to games as a medium. When you play a game, you make choices, and choices have consequences. That, again, is relatively unique to the interactive media and platform. Games also let you step into other people's shoes and make decisions with agency, and that, that's really unique. And so I, I put just a couple games up here um, that you may, some, some you're probably familiar with, some you're probably not. Um, a game like Civilization, which is a very, very successful franchise, um, you essentially, you essentially become, it, it's funny, Sid Meier, who created uh, Civilization, did the keynote at, games, at the Game Developers Conference two weeks ago in San Francisco, and he talked about People who play civilization are sort of egomaniacs, because essentially you play God, and <laughs> you create civilizations. Um, but it's, 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 it's interesting because Activision got the rights when I was doing the studios to do one version of civilization. And it was kind of a scary responsibility because we didn't have Sid Meier. And I actually hired um, a woman who, who's a very, who was a former assistant district attorney for East LA to make that game. And it was very interesting, because she wasn't Sid Meier, she came with a very different set of assumptions and kind of viewed history in, in a different way. And it, it really kind of hit home to me just how none of the decisions when you make a game are neutral. Everything has values. Every algorithm, every choice, whether, you know, what epochs you choose to, to, to focus in on, do you have slavery, do you not have slavery, these were all things that were debated. It was very, very interesting and very provocative. Remission is a very interesting title. Um, funded by the wife of the founder of eBay, Hannah Midiar. And it's a game uh, where kids who have cancer uh, could dive in and play an action-adventure game where they fought their illness in the context of the game. And they did a very rigorous three-year study, and they showed a pretty remarkable efficacy in the game. Because when the kids dove in and really got to um, immerse themselves in the language around the illness, the, 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 the sort of health around the illness, they got more engaged, and at the end of the day, you're, if you're a better patient, if you're a more engaged patient, the, the, the outcomes are very powerful. And this was a, a three-year clinical study that was built around it that's very interesting. Peacemaker is a game where, where you could play uh, the head of, uh, you could play the head of Israel and the head of, of, of Palestine in a very realistic simulation where your decisions had consequences. They used footage from Reuters, they had very interesting constellation of experts from both sides of the political conflict, and the game has been released on both sides of the political, co political conflict. And it's been really interesting to see how that's worked out. So again, that's, it's very unique to games. You can step into other people's shoes and make decisions and see the consequences. Uh, Dark Wars Dying was actually a, a, a contest that MTV did about three or four years ago. It was won by a USC student over here at, 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 the, at the game program. Um, the game was released on MTVU. It's had about five million plays. About 50,000 kids have signed up for real world uh, social action on it. I mean, it just speaks to the power, uh, it hints at the power of, of what games can do. The very essence of what makes games engaging is this delicate balance of challenges and rewards. In casual games, you often get a very quick cycle of challenge and rewards. In hardcore games, the cycles are a little bit elongated in terms of the challenge and rewards. But that's at the very core what makes games so engaging. And masterful game designers really know how to create that balance of challenges and rewards. And we've actually looked at, 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 at brain scans of, of, of kids and adults playing games versus, say, watching movies, and it lights up entirely different parts of the brain. This, this kind of interactive challenge-reward cycle is very, very powerful. Uh, and the ones who do it well are, are masterful. The Will Wrights, the Sid Meiers, the Miyamotos who, creates Mario, who created Mario, the Mario franchise. Another unique, really unique thing about game is you can fail in a safe environment, and in fact, failure can be fun, and failure can be evocative. So I put up a, a game called Climate Change there. This was a game that was funded by the BBC, and it was a, a British developer that did, a lot of games are, are, are data-driven. So, so they took very, uh, very interesting statistical models on climate change. And there's obviously a, a lot of debate on this data, and it, again, uh, one of the things that games can do is, is expose that data and let you put in different data or discuss the data assumptions behind the game. But they let you model the game in, in such a way that you could actually, in a statistically appropriate way, melt down the planet. It's, it's, it's a very evocative failure state. And they found that the ones that played out the failure state actually learned more than the ones that didn't. Because again, failure can be very powerful, very powerful and very memorable. 
Games are also increasingly becoming social and networked. I mean, when you watch a kid play a game, or a teenager, or an adult, the minute they run into a, a, a challenge, they'll either go online to the facts, to the hint groups, you know, it's, it's essentially just in time peer support, or they'll find somebody in the room, or they'll call up a friend. I mean, that's pretty powerful learning. It's just in time learning versus just in case learning. And it really maps to a lot of how the real world works when you're building businesses. You know, how you, how you tap your peer network or your professional network is actually really critical. And, and gamers are very effective at tapping into those networks. Um, the, number six is, is an interesting one. And it's, 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 a, it's a new trend in games that even people in the game industry don't have their arms totally around. But it's really critical when, when you talk about when, when one wants to discuss behavior change, which at the end of the day, a lot of social impact, especially with youth, if you're looking at things like childhood obesity, which, which uh, the First Lady has just announced a series of initiatives around, you're really talking about something very difficult uh, around behavior change. Um, a game is a product. When, when I was running the studios at Activision through the 90s, we made a product. We would make a game, we would put it in a box, and we would put it through a store. Uh, as, as the internet emerged and these digital channels emerged, uh, you could now release a game online, and people, this whole phenomenon of downloadable games emerged. Those are also games as a product. It's just being released through the digital channel. The newest trend is very different, games as a service. So the social networking games, the farm builds, the mafia wars, the virtual worlds that you get, like the Club Penguins, these are services, they're not products. They don't go away, they're mini, they're mi mini technology businesses. And the philanthropic sector and the government sector, the public interest sector, when they, they, they kind of know how to fund a game as a product, they don't really know how to fund a game as a service because it needs an ongoing funding cycle. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, how, the, how millions, tens of millions of dollars are actually being in a, ineffectively spent in the, in the public interest and philanthropic sector because they don't know the difference between a product and a service. And it's a textured difference. The other, uh, another really interesting attribute about games are they really <coughs> blend creation and consumption. So almost all the major game franchises from Spore to Call of Duty have modding tools where you can make your own levels, you can dive into the tool set and, 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 and extend the game. And it's really powerful stuff. Um, Call of Duty, which is an Activision franchise, uh, is an, it's an interesting example because uh, it's, uh, my, my business partner, uh, who I'll talk about when I talk about Eline Ventures and Eline Media, um, his nephew was really getting into Call of Duty, and, and he takes his nephew on a trip somewhere every year. And, uh, the year before last, he said that the nephew, who was like, I think he was 13 at the time, wanted to go to Normandy. And I was like, why do you want to go to Normandy? Because he had been playing Call of Duty, and he was fascinated by male bonding under, under the pressure of war. And it, my, my, my business partner and I happened to be out here. We were by the Activision Studios, so we drove by to one, two different studios making the Call of Duty franchise. So we went to one of the, the, the studios. And it happened the military consultant was there. And we connected him with, with my business partner's nephew. They actually started an email chain. They mapped out the, 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 the he, he like created a walking tour for the beaches of Normandy. They went there. He went on to read Band of Brothers. And he got really immersed in World War II. Well, that's powerful. I mean, motivation is powerful. So I mean, if you could build curriculum around these frontline games, the founder of, uh, one of the co-founders of Electronic Arts, Bing Gordon, who's now a venture capitalist at Bitcoiner Perkins, who actually invested in Zynga, which is uh, the, the most successful social networking company right now, uh, often has talked about if you were to rip off the covers of Madden football, you could probably teach most of high school math. I mean, a lot of how that game runs is really interesting. And, you know, it, tapping into kids' natural passion and building scaffolding around frontline titles is very interesting. And it goes to this idea that um, making games it, it is, is very powerful. Um, bits, atoms, and molecules. Increasingly, we're finding that games are crossing over from the digital world into the physical world, whether that's Guitar Hero with this, this new uh, sort of crazy uh, plastic guitar where you're sort of pushing buttons and playing guitar. The thing that's really interesting about that is even though you're not playing guitar, you have this fantasy that you are because you're immersed in the music, you're standing there holding the guitar. It's really remarkable, and the new band hero um, you know, I have an 8 and 11 year old, and, and when we set up Band Hero, it was the first time my, my 8 and 11 year old were really comfortable singing in a family environment in the living room, and the whole family was there playing. That's really powerful. 
And there is anecdotal evidence, I'd like to actually do research around this, that kids who play Guitar Hero are more likely to sign up to real world guitar lessons and music lessons. Well, that's behavior change. That's huge. That's powerful. I mean, there's a lot of nonprofits out there looking to, 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 to get kids engaged in music because a lot of the funding is going away in, in, in the education cycle and all of the, the sort of teach to the test. Well, if a video game can create that kind of behavior change, that's pretty powerful. Um, Dance Dance Revolution is, is one of a, a rising sector of games where, where you are actually physically moving. And, and again, that's, that's bits and atoms. It's, it's connecting the digital world with the physical world. Uh, the whole movement around putting pedometers uh, in kids' uh, clothes and shoes and getting them moving and marrying them to, to virtual worlds and characters and challenges and rewards. If, if you were to ask me the most effective way or one of the most effective ways to leverage the platform, to, to, to address uh, the epidemic of childhood obesity, I would say the clues are there. I don't think it's an issue of a gap in knowledge. <coughs> in general, kids know they need to exercise. In general, kids know they, what's a healthy food and what's a bad food. It's just hard to change behavior. It's, it's peer to peer pressure, it's parent pressure, it's, it's a constant awareness. I think the clues to behavior change are more service based than product based. Thanks. Um, for me, I think uh, motivation is, is one of the most important things when it comes to, to, to learning uh, and, and the big education, the issues around education. I mean, I was astounded when I found out about two to three years ago, because my background is not education, uh, that 30% of kids in the country don't finish high school, they drop out. 50% of kids in many cities are dropping out. I mean, those are astounding numbers. And when, when, I, when I first sort of dove into these numbers, it was during the, the last presidential campaign, and actually neither Obama nor McCain made this a priority. Like, I didn't see in any of the town hall meetings this come up on either side. I mean, that is astounding. And so we, what, but, so we dove into kind of some of these numbers, and right around that time, uh, the Gates Foundation put out a report called The Silent Epidemic, which, where, where they went and actually talked to a lot of the kids who dropped out. And the number one reason, I mean, it's a complex constellation of issues, but the number one reason that was cited was, was lack of relevancy. Uh, of, of school was just not relevant to, to the world that they were living in. I mean, that is, that is really significant to me. And yet, nearly 100% of the kids that were interviewed play computer and video games. So we, we've been working at my company to connect these dots. We're working on a game around entrepreneurship for low-income at-risk kids that actually unlocks tools to make real money in the real world because we found that a lot of, of, of the, the businesses that kids wanted to start uh, involved uh, tools that actually exist online, but they're not necessarily aware of these tools. And they're not necessarily aware of how to use these tools and how to put these tools together. Um, so we've been thinking a lot about how to provide scaffolding around tools that actually already exist from on-demand supply chains for personalized merchandise all the way through to Google AdWords. Um, and provide a game construct so kids can go in and try and fail businesses in a safe way, fix broken businesses that are very evocative, uh, and then earn the right uh, or earn the tools that are publicly available to effectively accelerate their businesses. Um, I think when you know when kids are motivated, when grown-ups are motivated, they can move mountains. When they're not motivated, <laughs> you need mountains to move them. So I think motivation is huge. <laughs> I mean, and, and then just the numbers are, are, are massive, um, and these numbers are, are, are constantly going up. But this, this slide speaks not only to the fact that this is an incredibly huge sector, um, but it's a complex sector. And uh, it's a sector that if you don't know what you're doing, uh, you can waste a lot of money really, really quickly. Um, which leads to sort of the next, next part of the talk, which is, I left the game business in 2000, and I actually started a company uh, that was a double bottom line company, financial return, social return. It was originally funded by foundations, and then I raised venture money and strategic money. And you know, we, we were looking to balance financial returns and social impact, and I'll, I'll get to some of those methodologies in a second. But I came back to games about two years ago, and I was just astounded. Every major foundation is either funding games or about to fund games. Every major government department is either funding games or about to fund games, and they're wholly unqualified to do so. I, I, I actually call them accidental game publishers, because if you think about what a game publisher does, there's a difference between a game publisher and a game developer. A game publisher, like Activision, Electronic Arts, these are publishers. What they do is they provide the capital to make a game, 
they select a development team. That development team might be an internal team that, 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 that is part of the company, or it might be an external team that they hire. They then have to manage the developer, and every developer runs into trouble at some point because technology's hard, entertainment's hard. When you put them together, it's really hard. They then have to market, distribute, and support the games. That's what a publisher does. A developer makes the game. Uh, they'll have lead programmers, they'll have designers, they'll have producers, they'll have art directors, and it's a team that makes the game. The problem with, with government-funded games and foundation-funded in general is they are trying to do what a publisher does. They provide capital to make a game, often based on really interesting research and insights. They'll select a developer, usually through an RFP, a, a request for proposal process, and uh, they'll then have to manage the developer, which they don't really do. They just provide a grant and then kind of walk away. And at the end of the day, they're responsible for the game getting out there if they want to have impact, which is really marketing and distribution, even if it's purely for a social return or a learning return or a health return. And they're not really qualified to do that because it's really hard. Um, so we, we ended up, before we started this company, we spent about a year and a half looking at about 200 philanthropically funded games and, and government funded game projects, most of which are, are running off the rails or, or not really making impact. A few are really starting to move the needle. Uh, and it was, it was fascinating. So actually the blog post that, 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 that they asked me to do, you know, is around an idea that started in 2006, but I think now at the time, we have a corporation for public broadcasting, we have a national public radio, but we have no analog for games. And yet, our taxpayers' dollars are going into games, often with, with the potential for efficacy. So I believe there needs to be some national public gaming initiative just to make sure we're doing this efficiently before we even start creating the funding mechanisms and public-private partnerships. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these slides. Last night at the, at the, at the game school, I, I talked more about this. But I do believe there's a, a rigorous methodology that can be put in place to make games with impact. And it starts with defining an audience, understanding the context, whether it's gonna be in a school, an after school, at home, parent, is there a moderator, is it kids directly? Entirely different games will be made depending on the context. And you need to make those decisions before you make the game, not after you make the game. You have to really understand the impact you want. And only then, once you really understand the audience, both demographic, psychographic, the context and the impact, can you select a platform? Maybe it's a mobile SMS game. Maybe it's an Xbox Live game. You know, maybe it's it's a, a, a DS game. I mean, there's, there's these are entirely different platforms with entirely different teams that can do it. And then you have to understand if it's a game as a service, how is it going to be sustainable? Uh, what kind of financial returns do you want in terms of, of the design? You know, what is the organic alignment of your impact goals and, and the gameplay? What games are about verbs? They're about running, jumping, shooting, thinking, exploring. Uh, you know, what are the verbs that apply to the game? And then actually executing. And then assessment and optimization is interesting. Since this is about impact, I mean, assessment is a huge area when it comes to impact. Um, there, are two, there are two trends in games that I find very interesting that I think can actually change the way, broadly speaking, the impact sector looks, looks at assessment. One is embedded assessment. When you play a game like Civilization, you can't beat that game without having some mastery about the knowledge of civilizations and problem solving. Now, if you design the game with the intent of, uh, and you can't finish the game unless there's certain knowledge or problem solving, and you design the game properly, finishing the game itself is, is, is the assessment. And actually, Cisco and some other companies are now certifying thousands of employees through games. Once they finish the game, they're certified. And that is embedded assessment. It's a very powerful concept. Uh, we've been talking to the Department of Education about this. I mean, assessment, no child left behind, is a very complex political issue. But this idea of embedded assessment is, is, is a very powerful thread. I think an even more powerful thread is actually what's happening with these social network games. How many of you have played like a, a Farmville or a Zynga or have been badgered by a hundred of your online friends to play a Farmville or a Zynga? So, I mean, again, Farmville is this social networking game put out by this company, Zynga. It sits on top of, of, of Facebook. They now have over 80 million players. I mean, it's, it's astounding. I mean, it is the most, I think, the most successful game in, ever um, in terms of just number of users. Um, they raised about $3 million for Haiti in like a week through the network. I mean, the power of these networks, and these games tap into what they call the social graph. It's all about friend-to-friend -friend gameplay and friends inviting friends. Uh, they have a free-to-play business model with microtransactions. That's how they make money. Broadly speaking, 90%-ish will play for free. 
eight or nine percent will buy some virtual items or sign up for a Netflix trial. Um, and then one to two percent, maybe three percent if they're doing well, will kind of make it their identity <coughs> and will buy a lot of stuff. And they're phenomenally profitable. I mean, it's like a, they're valued, I think, over a billion dollars right now. And they started two years ago. But what's interesting about that is this, these are data-driven games. They have game designers, puristic mathematicians looking at the data every day and saying, how do we, how do we maximize this for viral propagation, friend-to-friend -friend propagation, which is a combination of game design, interface design, uh, production, and how do we maximize free-to-play? How do we get the free players to pay us something? What if you took that same rigor and applied it to learning or civic participation? It's essentially real-time optimization towards impact versus you know, traditional formative summative. Now, sometimes you need to do long-term impact studies. It's just that's what you need to do to, to properly assess impact. But, but if it's something like civic participation or getting kids out to do something, you can do that in real time. You can see the results in real time, and you can optimize it in real time. And I think there's a lot to be learned from the game sector in that area. So I'm, I'll pause to see if there's questions. And then the second half of what I'm going to go to is given all of this that we learned, that games are this incredibly powerful uh, opportunity for impact. There's hundreds of millions of dollars flowing through the philanthropic and public interest sector towards games and impact. We decided we wanted to play, as entrepreneurs, as social entrepreneurs, we wanted to play in that space. Originally, we thought we were gonna play in the space as, as investors, that we would raise a fund, we would put in a little bit of our own angel dollars, but we didn't have that many angel dollars. We had enough to sort of get it started but then we would raise an investment fund, a double bottom line investment fund, to invest in companies that are doing games with impact. We decided not to do that because when we dove in, we found there was not an investable thesis there. There were not a com enough companies that would fit our thresholds for investment. But what we found was, when we looked at the 100, 200 projects, there were a half dozen projects that we really thought were investable, but they all needed the same scaffolding. They needed the same technology support, they needed the same marketing and distribution support, they needed the same business model rigor, and we realized what was needed was a publishing thesis, not an investment thesis. And the only way we learned that was by getting out there and spending almost a year talking to entrepreneurs, looking at projects, talking to other funders, mapping out the whole ecosystem, seeing where the gaps were in the ecosystem. So I'll just plow through and then, then we can just have a, a full Q&A session. So what I thought I might do is I'll show you a couple slides from our deck when we were going out to raise a fund that we've now put aside but helped inform, and then I'll show you a couple slides from our current deck, which is as a publisher. So we, we decided that we wanted to make impact. You know, there's a lot of investment in environment stuff, microfinance, community development, and yet, you know, with the incredible power of popular media, kids spend eight hours a day on average engaged with popular media. They spend more time engaged with popular media than they do in school. We felt like popular media was being underinvested as an impact sector and games in specific. So you know, when we were looking at the sector, we said, okay, that's, that's a sector we want to play in. Our core thesis is that if you can align your business model with your impact, they can scale together. I have, I have been involved in businesses where that alignment was not clear and they frayed. And, um, this, I mean, it's, it's, it seems like a simple point, but it is one of the most important points, that if, you, if there is a misalignment with your core impact, with the natural trajectory of, of how you're gonna make money, it will fray and it will become very difficult. Um, the other thing is, because we can't be domain experts in all the areas where we wanna make impact, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's health, whether it's 21st century learning skills, we, we create multi-stakeholder partnerships where on in the, where we're thinking in every investment now on every project we make sure we, we find the best of breed nonprofit foundation academic in that impact area they become part of our green light process they become part of our design process and they become part of our assessment process because again we can't we, we bring up domain expertise in terms of the business and the games but not all the impact areas this is another one that, that we learned the hard way and this is an opinion other people disagree with this but what we found was when we were looking at all these different projects, that, uh, and when we were looking at the, uh, at, at the fund, it gets, you know, so financial returns, social impact. So clearly most businesses are seeking financial returns. Some of them have an organic impact. I would argue an eBay is, is very close to the social impact side, but huge financial returns. Others are just really bad businesses. Well, the really bad businesses do, do bad business and bad social impact. So we probably don't want to be there. But uh, a lot of nonprofits are down here. They're fully subsidized. Some have earned income revenue streams, and they pop over. Um, but clearly, we want to be in the top right quadrant. 
what we found was that in order to, to raise the fund, and this is true of our business, we decided that um, if we're in this kind of murky middle area, it gets really confusing as to every day, are we optimizing this business for financial returns or are we optimizing for social impact? And everybody had a different opinion. And as you start to scale a company, that starts to get more and more confusing. And all of the different stakeholders, the investors, the partners, the employees, aren't sure, what am I, where am I optimizing for here? So we decided that uh, for our company, and in this case for the fund, uh, we, are, we are looking for market or better returns. That's just, we're, we're, that, that's something we're doing. So we filter our opportunities for ones that we believe have market or better returns. Now we may or may, we have to execute well to do that, but it has to have an embedded social impact. And it has to have that alignment. So of the 200 and some projects we looked at, there was only three or four that had that. The rest we put aside. Now, we did come across projects that, that, that had the opportunity for incredible social impact. But there was just not, there was just not a, a, a model for financial returns, or even sometimes sustainability. Like we're working on a game with Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times about the most difficult issues that our world faces around maternal mortality, forced prostitution, very difficult issues. And we do think there are some methodologies that games can raise awareness and put more wind behind the sails of folks on the ground making a difference. Uh, and I can talk about some of that stuff. But there's no business model that wants to go with that. It just doesn't want to do that. So we, we thought we would create a separate funding vehicle for that. And that we would separate the two. But there would be a lot of learnings. We could leverage the same technology. We could leverage some of the skills. We could leverage some of the distribution. But they are two different funding vehicles with two different expectations. So the idea is we have a, 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 a lead fund and a sidecar fund. So you know, there would be a market return fund and an impact first fund. And we had a whole, you know, a whole set of machinations for how we would run those two funds. Um, we would get strategic industry partners from the game industry and strategic impact partners to sit on the green light, uh, on, on this case, in, on the investment committee to assess it, to make sure we had domain expertise and impact expertise. And again, we had a whole methodology for how the fund would work. And then we went into detail as to what everyone's responsibilities were. And then we threw that out. Um, <laughs> but, but, but actually, a lot of the learnings have informed what we're doing as a company. The reason we threw that out is we could not find companies to invest in. And because we could not find enough companies to invest in, we could not raise a fund. Um, and so it's, it's not so much that we threw it out. We decided not to, to create a, 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 an investment vehicle. We decided to create a, a, a publishing vehicle. So a publishing vehicle is a company. And it's funny, because my, my business partner and I have, have, have been part of, I mean, I've been part of startups my whole life. Some of them have been wildly successful, some of them have not. But I didn't want to do another one, and neither did he. But there was such a powerful opportunity here, we decided to do it, and now that we're, now we're excited. This is going to be the last one. But now, now we're really excited about starting this company. So real quickly, you know, this is how it sort of changes from a, a fund to a company. Now this is like a traditional presentation you would do to a venture capitalist or to a, somebody who wants to invest in a company. You know, it's a big market size. It, there's a lot of opportunity for impact. We're a little more learning-centric with our company than health-centric, uh, and there's a whole set of reasons for why we went that way. Um, we have a very specific methodology. We believe learning happens all the time. It's 24-7. It's in school, out of school, after school, libraries, museums, peer-to-peer. -peer. So we have kind of a kids choose, parent approved, teachers use methodology. We're going for all browser-based, free-to-play, games as a service, because we believe it's capital efficient. These are all the sort of things you, you would pitch when you pitch a company, because um, we're now a company, not a fund. We have a pipeline of projects. We've, we've picked up a couple uh, philanthropically funded projects that have run off the rails that we're now going to help put back on the rails and publish. Uh, we build out a management team. So we have, you know, again, a, uh, for a publisher, the, the art of a publisher is all about what do you green light and what do you not green light and how do you support the projects you do green light. So we have a very specific set of green light filters for how something gets through, both financial and, and otherwise. And then we have a slate of, of, of games that we're working on. So I'll stop there, but I thought that might help do three things. Explain why I believe games are a powerful platform for social impact. And Here's a, a first attempt at how to address that opportunity that we decided not to pursue, and this is what we're pursuing, and then kind of throw it open to, to questions. Any questions? <laughs> Thanks. I'm happy to talk about the projects. I'm happy to talk about any, any aspect of this.
Department of Education on how your relationship with that has evolved, what kind of stumbling blocks you've had, and how you've overcome them. Well, we're a long way from overcoming, <laughs> but um, it's it's been almost a surreal experience. Um, um, because we're, 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 we've now been, we've done four White House briefings, we've done briefings at almost every major edu agency, none of this was planned. Um, it, it happened mostly through, um, the MacArthur Foundation has taken a real lead in the space. They have something called the Digital Media and Learning Initiative. Uh, they're in, I think, their fourth year of, of grants in that space. Um, they have a constellation of very, very powerful game-based researchers. There's a guy named James Paul G. at Arizona State that is kind of the leading researcher in the space. There's a woman named Katie Salen at Institute of Play, a nonprofit in New York, that actually, through a MacArthur funding, set up a, a school. It's a, it's a New York City public school and based entirely on game theory called Quest to Learn. Through that ecosystem, which is very much on the agenda of the Department of Education, um, we've gotten involved in the ecosystem. So that's how we kind of got introduced to the ecosystem. Then what happened with, with this first product, GameStar Mechanic. So the MacArthur Foundation had funded this project with Jim G and Katie Salen as the principal investigators. And it's a game to teach eight to 14 year olds how to design games. Because it turns out when you, when you design a game, you're designing a system. And it's a complex system. It's a system that has to be in balance. If you put in bad guys, you have to put in good guys. It's a, it's a digital system for somebody else to use. This is very hard to do. And a, a lot of these new, what they call 21st century learning skills, which are skills kids are gonna need for a job in the 21st century, problem solving, digital media uh, literacy, fast changing interfaces, collaboration. Game design has a lot of those. So they, they've done a bunch of research and testing, and the testing has been very powerful in terms of uh, the, the, the sort of systems theory that comes out of game design. But the really interesting thing is, for eight to 14 year olds, especially boys, but a surprising number of girls, this doesn't feel like work. They're dying to design games. So you have incredible motivation. You have incredible embedded learning. So the MacArthur Foundation put a lot of money uh, relative to what foundations grant in this sort of space. And they hired one of the, one of the most talented game companies in New York, the, the company that made the game Diner Dash and some very pop, popular casual games. But the game got away from the developer a bit. And the, this game was going to be the anchor of this new New York City public school, a quest to learn. It was going to open. And unfortunately, the game developer went out of business. And so the game wasn't finished. And so here was this remarkable opportunity, this remarkable game. There's a school that's ready to use it, and tons of schools waiting to use it. So this is a very long answer to your question. I apologize. But um, so, so they asked, because, because we had been tracking this project, and we had been consulting on other MacArthur projects, Sandra Day O'Connor is doing a series of games around getting kids involved in civics, and we did some work on that. So we had been doing some consulting for them. They asked us to take over the project and get it up and running for the school, which we did. It opened last fall. The school's been using it. It's been amazing watching the kids engage with this product. Um, and we fell in love with it. When we, when we actually tested it with the kids, when we looked at the research, when we looked at, at our, all of those filters that I showed you, I could go through every one of those filters and explain why this game passed every one of those gates. We've done a, we decided to do a deal with the intellectual property is owned by the nonprofit. It's funded by the foundation. And we did a deal where we have the worldwide publishing rights. Um, and it's, it's, it's a game as a service. So they want this to scale. They want it to be profitable. But we, we came to an agreement where there's going to be a very robust free version that has all of the core pedagogy. The learning guide will be free with all of the core pedagogy. But they've encouraged us to build premium channels for consumers and teachers where we can make money. And it's our job to make them interesting enough that we can convert the, the, the free to the play. And uh, we have a licensing fee with, that will flow money back into the nonprofit to make them sustainable to continue the research. It seems like a great model if we can execute on it. So we're, and we're doing where we're, it's going to come out this summer. So we're right in the middle of it. So because we took over this project, because we worked out this model, the folks at the Department of Education who've also been funding games like this that they're worried won't be sustainable have contacted us and said, let's talk about methodology. So that's a long answer to why we got involved. Now, it, it's beyond the scope of, of this talk to talk about all the different threads of, of the Department of Education. Now, I'm not an expert in the space, but I'm learning fast. Um, there's a couple things that I think are very interesting. One is, uh, there's a lot of complaints from people in the, in the technology space, the digital media space, and the game space that the school channel is just broken, and you can't get into the school channel, and it's, and it's a nightmare. 
And there's some truth to that. It's, it, it, is, it is a very fragmented channel. The states are not in sync. They're talking about doing common standards to make them in sync. The, the sort of 21st century learning skills are not part of the no child left behind teaches the test. So there's a lot of issues out there. That said, I think most technology companies and game companies are irresponsible or, or they're, they're not willing to do the hard work to say, okay, that's still the landscape. There is still a lot of teachers that want to use this stuff. You, if you want to get into the schools, you have to understand the teacher's needs. The teachers are time stressed. You have to reduce the friction for them to adopt it. And so we, we found digital media projects that have scaled to hundreds of thousands of teachers, purely bottom-up, teacher-to-teacher, very successfully because they took the time to reduce the friction. They, they didn't say, I'm going to make something and then complain the channel's broken. They understood the channel and then designed the product to be effectively used in the channel. And that's hard to do, but that's publishing as opposed to just developing. So I do think there's an opportunity there. From the Department of Education side, though, I do think their movement towards common core standards will help so that you don't have to go state by state and district by district. I do think, uh, and Gates is leading this effort too, that a set of assessment models around 21st century learning skills is also going to be a great sector riser. And also funding vehicles. There's a lot of funding vehicles in the Department of Education. They have a thing called SBIRs, which is for for-profit companies to do learning impact, and it's it's really innovative stuff. And and they're all up there. They're you know they're all on their site to find. We've applied for a couple as well. So I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a, no, a number of different parts of it. Yeah. Um, so in my given experience, it seems like there's a lot of conflict between maybe parents and groups that think that games don't have any you know impact on how kids can get an education out of it. It may attribute to the violence, you know, them growing up being violent. How does E-Line Media market a product that has, you know, this kind of negative viewpoint from certain groups? And then also, the second question, how many hours a week do you let your kids play video games? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the two questions are, are completely interrelated, actually. And it's, uh, it's actually one, one of the things that I think is our biggest opportunity. Um, I'm going to start with the second one. Because it, so game start, I, my kids are in, in this demographic, and um, part of the reason we picked it up is they and all their friends loved it, but they played way too much. It drove me nuts. As a parent, I had to, I, I had, I had to yell at them to stop playing. So, and when I speak with parent groups, which I do often, the number one concern overwhelmingly is my kids are spending too much time playing games, not the content. That, but when I was at Activision, the number one concern was the content and the violence. Now the number one concern is my kids are spending too much time. And a couple things are going on. Uh, the parents, the first time gamer parents are having kids, so they have a little bit more sensitivity to the medium. Uh, um, but I will, and, and having just been in China and Korea where there's a real game addiction problem, I believe that is a huge issue. So one thing we're doing at Eli Media, and we're actually doing this on two, two levels. For, for GameStar, we're building an entire uh, parent timing mechanism uh, where we're educating parents on First of all, you need to manage how much time your kids play the game, and we're going to do everything in our power to help you manage it. Second of all, you have to be sensitive to the fact that uh, when a kid is in the middle of playing a level or designing a level, simply coming in and saying, stop right now, is not always the right thing to do. And I use the example of, you know, you're watching the Super Bowl, and it's in overtime, and there's about to be a, a, a field goal kick, and the kid comes in and says, you said you would go out with me, turn off the TV right now. I mean, so there's a certain respect for the child in the medium, that said, it has to be managed, and, and I believe there are best practices. Further, I've contacted um, five or six of the most successful uh, tween-based gaming sites, all of who agree, and so I'm saying we, what we should do as a group is design one set of systems for parents so that they don't have to learn it with each of our games because then they're never going to use it. We have to reduce the friction for the parents because this is a real issue for all of us, and it's also responsible. We have kids. They spend too much time playing games, so, so I, I firmly believe that. In terms of, of the larger issue of the content side of it, it's a very complex debate. I could argue both sides pretty, pretty convincingly. Part of the reason why I, I, I left the commercial business is some of the games I, made me uncomfortable, and I didn't want to work that hard for, for games that I just was not wholly in belief of. However, a lot of the evidence, I mean, you, you, there's a lot of evidence that you know on a macro level, with the rise of games, actual violence among the, the gaming community has gone down. How do you parse that? I don't know. I, it, it's kind of like the, 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 the Supreme Court justice in pornography. You see something and you just know it's not right. That's, and I'm not going to do something that I don't believe in. Um,
but I, I, I think parent I think parents are becoming more open to games. Um, I and you know there's almost every week now there's an article on why games are good or games are good for learning. So if there's not this visceral let's shut it down, the the politicians you know Obama's talking about game competitions versus the politicians in the past were just games are bad. It's, it's sort of, so I think that's changing. Um, the last thing that we're doing is. For like game star mechanic, because there's real learning principles, when kids design games, we're gonna let parents opt in so that they can A, get the games that their kids designed, because I think that's engaging with the kids. We don't, I'm on the board of the, Na the National Advisory Board of the CUNY Center at Sesame Workshop, and we see a lot of research on co-viewing. When, when you read to a child, it's not so much just the words you're reading that has the impact, it's the conversation around it. It's the, situ the situated meaning, the situated learning. Games are an incredible platform for, for co-play, situated learning, situated meaning. So we want to get parents to actually play with the kids. And the fact is, the Wii did it. The Wii took everybody's surprise because the new Wii, the, the Wii remote, when it first came out, leveled the playing field. Suddenly, parents could compete on the same level. Now, kids have gone way past them, as they're apt to do, but it was still a powerful phenomenon. There are a lot of Wiis where you see families playing together for the first time, and I believe that's as healthy as reading for a kid. It's not either or, it's just a healthy concept. So we think a lot about intergenerational gameplay, challenges to get the parents involved. We'll send the parents the games the kids made and talk about the principles that they learned. So that it's, it's less abstract for them. So it's a, it's a great question. It's, it's, I, I see it as a business opportunity to get the parents engaged and to build up a brand that the parents really trust because we're taking the time to think through their challenges and needs. Yeah. Um, so at our lab, we live about is that top right hand quadrant where we look at market returns or returns versus uh, social impact. And it doesn't surprise me that you weren't able to find deal flow, especially if you were looking for market rate returns. How do you internally manage that with your staff? You don't have investors, so it makes perfect sense. Uh, but how do you manage that with your staff to know which one you're looking for, whether you're looking for returns versus looking for impact? We, 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 we've separated them. So even in the publisher model, our company is, is at that top one. So our green light filters, it has to have the potential for market or better returns with embedded impact. We just turn down everything that doesn't. Now, the things that we think could really move the needle on the social impact side, we do through our philanthropic arm. You know, we'll do through for Games for Change. So even though, it, I mean, as a publisher, we're doing the same thing that we were gonna do as investors. We, they're two separate vehicles, and we don't try to mix the two. I mean, there, there are a lot of companies, and I think we, you, know, you guys mentioned it, uh, in terms of companies that, that uh, they make money and then they'll give a certain percentage away. But that's a complex thing in that it, I, I've seen companies try that and they have, when, when they scale that tension gets there because it's hard to build a business. It's hard to get the dollars, especially when you're, you're, you're starting out. And if there's a tax on it, that's fine, but you've got to make sure that the business can scale with that tax on it. And because I've seen a lot not scale with the tax on it. So we tend to focus on finding the alignment in the core product itself versus making money here and giving away money here. Just because in our assessment of the space, we've seen a lot of companies struggle to do that in, in the startup phase. Now again, that, that can, I don't think that's bad. And I think that can be part of a brand and it's part of what makes a company special. It's, it's just you, gotta, you have to build your, your finances so you can really pull that off. We chose, I mean, we sort of do that because in our publishing model, we have a licensing fee that, go, that where, where, where that goes back to the philanthropy, but that's a, it's, it's like we licensed a property, and we, 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 we err on the side of generosity with that licensing fee because we really believe in it, but we also think it's gonna go back into the research and as a virtuous loop. So, the, but the short answer is we really do separate them, even in our, in our publishing business. And we have to turn down a lot of stuff as a result. I just want to make sure I understand fully the, the business model because it's a new language for me. So first of all, it sounds like some of the games that you're developing and publishing are both the console-based and the online kind of version, like the a la Zynga. Is that right? You're doing both? Or? Yeah, I mean, our, for, as a publisher, initially we're focused on <laughs> free-to-play online browser-based games. But um, as a secondary market, if we are successful, we will license them probably for the Nintendo DS and the Sony PSP, because for a variety of reasons they will work on that platform. Um, but that's a tactical choice. I mean, we look at every gaming platform as a potential market for us. It's just because we're small and initially starting, 
we, we want to zero in on a, a platform where we can reuse the technology and tools. So we're starting there. We'll, we'll do licensing for, for, the cons, for, for the handhelds. And then if we start to see an opportunity uh, in the consoles and handhelds first, we'll go there first. Not, there's, there's no reason why we wouldn't do that other than we want to have focus initially. Yeah, there are very few. Um, I, I think I think the ones the ones that that I would say were inspired by tend to be ones you wouldn't necessarily think are impact focused. It would be something like the Sim City or the Sims franchise. I mean, the Sim City has created an entire generation of city planners, and there's a lot of sort of. So to me, that it's more the the sort of the frontline commercial games that really have embedded learnings that we're finding teachers are using all over the world and seeing you know, what is that magic that they're creating. Um, that's where we tend to get the inspiration. If you go to the Games for Change website, none of those have meaningful financial returns. Not one game on that site has meaningful financial returns. Some have real meaningful social impact. Uh, so again, it's a very young sector, uh, and there are not a ton of, uh, of success stories if, 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 you, if you start with the sort of filter of games that are funded by foundations or governments and look for financial returns. It's more looking for the ones in the commercial industry that have somehow pulled it off. I would say Wyville is a great example. I don't know, do you, are you guys familiar with Wyville? It's, it's a virtual world, it's been around, it's a bunch of folks from Caltech, about nine years ago started it. It's mostly tween girls, um, but it's all kind of science-based. They've done some astounding things. The entire community governs itself, and there's a very interesting self-governance. They've done partnerships with CDC where they uh, put a virus into the virtual world and the kids had to identify the virus and solve the virus. I mean, they, they really understand the nature of, of, of social activity and impact. So, and, and they're making money. I mean, that's a, that's a revenue generating for profit. So there are examples like that out there, but they really are few and far between right now. I know you touched on this briefly when you were talking about the concept or context of where you believe will be distributed at schools, out of school, whatnot. I'm just wondering um, kind of what challenges you see and what kind of ideas you have if they're not going to be sold or distributed to schools, like to the families or kids that don't maybe have the support system <coughs> from the family or are attending schools that have, can use this type of you know, education. How do you plan to like mass market that or kind of you know face that challenge of having your 11 year old want to choose playing the game of being a peacemaker, you know, for the Palestine versus Israel, or choosing you know the the one that's with the guns and whatever. You know, I'm it's, I'm not in the game world, but right. you know, like, I don't know. I'm wondering. Um, well, there's guns in the Palestine and Israel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's 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 effect, it, it, it's effective marketing. It's 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 identifying who it is that you want to reach and build understanding where they are. And, and you know, I always look at uh, who is effectively reaching the target audience I want with with any product and service. How are they doing it? And and what can I learn? And I think the key is not to be a tweener to sort of half do a bunch of them. So uh, because you, you had, there was a couple embedded things in your question. I mean, one is. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at, at underserved communities and how would we reach them with something like GameStar Mechanic? Because actually I think that's where it has its biggest impact. I mean, we've been piloting it in a bunch of, of inner city schools, Title I schools, and that is where it's having the greatest impact because these are the kids that are at greatest risk of dropping out and, and we're connecting with them and we've seen it work. So there are entire organizations like One Economy and whatnot that just focus on distribution to, to those communities. And, and we can leverage the distribution and expertise they've already built. We don't have to build that. Um, there's special funding we're applying for to enable us to, 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 to have a more robust version of the free version. So that these are all tactics we do to reach that community. <coughs> the second part of your question was more, if the parent, how does a parent convince a kid to play this game versus that game? And that, 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 that's complex. We're gonna learn a lot about that. but. Part of it depends on age. There's a big difference between an eight-year-old and a 14-year-old as to what they have access to uh, and what they don't have access to and how much is parent-driven versus peer-driven and, and kid-driven. So that's one piece as to where on the age spectrum you're, you're talking about. Um, 
There is a concept of parent approved game time and sort of parent open game time that we see in a lot of houses. So that's a piece. I mean, I get calls all the time from parents wanting to find the, the, the edutainment titles uh, from the 90s, like Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, Oregon Trail. There were some wonderful titles that came out in the 90s, and that whole sector blew up for, for a bunch of interesting reasons. But parents are still looking for that stuff, and those games are fun. Kids don't mind playing them, but the kids also want to play their other stuff. So again, there's no silver bullet there. It's just a lot of homework that you need to do, and, and you got to just try it and then keep optimizing it. Um, I would say they have been in the space and they have been successful. And why um, are, those successful? are you guys familiar with Flow, Flower, Cloud? They, they, they were actually started here. I mean, the, the, a couple buildings away, one of the best game programs in the world, game programs exists. Uh, Tracy Fullerton, Chris Swain, I mean, they're, 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 the work they're doing is amazing. And there was a, two students that came out of that program and they did a game called Flow, which is I mean, it's, it's unlike any game you've ever seen. It, it was uh, released on the Sony PlayStation Network. So unfortunately, because it was just on Sony, it doesn't have necessarily the broad-based awareness that I think it should have. But it's a very meditative game. It's a beautiful game um, where you just, you just have to see it to believe it. But it's, 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 it's very different than most games you, you've seen in terms of it's, it, it's, uh, it's visually stunning. It's a very peaceful game. It's, it's, it's kind of an emotional game. Um, and Sony actually saw the game, they essentially bought the company, and they, they have a three game deal, they're on their third game releasing through the Sony PlayStation, and for a long time, I don't know if it's still the case, it was the number one download, paid download on Sony PlayStation, so it's been very financially successful. These are essentially artists. They're pushing the fold of the medium in an entirely new way, and part of the reason they can do it, I mean, aside from the fact of having a great program here at USC, and they're just a phenomenally talented team, is, Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo now all have online downloadable services. So Xbox Live Arcade on Microsoft, WiiWare on Nintendo, and PlayStation Network on Sony. What, what that enables is short form content that can be experimental that you can buy for less than 10 bucks. And so that opens up a direct channel where you don't have to go through a store. It opens up lower cost products and services and they're looking for the flows and the flowers. They're looking for stuff to expand the game audience, they're looking for innovative stuff. So it's a great opportunity that not enough people are tapping into and that team tapped into. So I would absolutely put it, in fact, I'm, Kelly Santiago, who's one of the two folks, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm moderating a panel in two weeks for like 3,000 art teachers across the country that are coming to Baltimore. And we're gonna show Flow and Flower, we're gonna show Peacemaker, we're gonna show uh, uh, tra some of Tracy's new products that are coming through that I saw last night that are amazing just to get our teachers thinking about this medium in a whole new way. So absolutely, I'm a big fan of them. Um, so I was really struck by your discussion of uh, philanthropic funders as sort of accidental publishers and how a lot of the money coming into this space doesn't have any way to make sure that the products have impact. Um, so I think I heard you propose a couple of solutions. One was a kind of national public gaming organization and then also um, using E-Line as a way to bring some of these products to market. But beyond that, if you were to sit down with NIH or NSF or a foundation, what advice would you offer them to make sure their products do wind up having the social impact they're looking for? Well, we are sitting down with them. And the vehicle we're using is actually Games for Change. Um, so because there was such a demand for this, and you know, we debated doing it with an E-Line, and we, just, we didn't have the capacity to develop our games and provide that consulting service. So we're actually doing that through Games for Change. Games for Change just started a consulting service uh, under the nonprofit, um, so it's, and it's, it's perfectly aligned with the mission of the nonprofit. And what we do is we, 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 we just signed one huge government agency and one big foundation, and what we do is we workshop their idea. So we, 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 we try to get them before they invest. In, in both of these cases, they've invested and, and it wasn't successful, so now they want to rethink it. But, um, we go in, and, and, and it's the two slides that, that, that I've shown. We have a very rigorous methodology. We first say, who is the audience, and what is the impact? And you'd be surprised how just getting them to be in sync on their side as to who is the audience and what is the impact is actually an effort. That has nothing to do with games. It's just, what do you really, really, really want to do here? Because unless we know what you really, really want to do, it's very hard for us to help you. So we get audience impact, then we talk about context. Okay, you know, are, are we in a village? Are we, are, 
what is the context of the village? Are we in a school? What, where, where are we here? Where, where is this going to be used? Then we talk about platform. Okay, it's an SMS mobile game or it's an Xbox Live Arcade game. Then we bring in experts on that platform, designers, developers who know that platform, and then we workshop it through and then we hand it off. I mean, eventually we may get into actually making the games, but we're not there yet. So I believe that the, the, the most effective model for NIH or NSF is workshopping concepts. NSF is a little different because NSF has been doing games for a couple of years. Um, there, I actually think the, the methodology is more a portfolio. How do you look at your gaming portfolio? How do you build infrastructure and scaffolding for your portfolio? It's a slightly different conversation for an agency that is actively making multiple games uh, versus an agency that just wants to do a game or a foundation that wants to do a game. But to me, the National Public Gaming Initiative, the reason why I think it, it could be a great sort of bipartisan uh, initiative and start very small is really just to workshop the things that are already being funded or about to be funded to making sure that they're efficiently done and not even be a funding agency until we get our arms around that. We'll take one or two more questions from the two. Okay. Uh, would you please talk about why the edutainment market blew up other than, you know, it was hard to make a CD that would work on all the different OSs? Yeah. I mean, that was definitely one of the reasons. The, Somebody should do a business case study on it because it, you know, we, we did a little bit of research because obviously it's relevant to what we're doing and we knew we knew enough of the players. There was a series of companies, um, Broderbund, Davidson, Learning Company, Knowledge Adventure. There was, there was a family of companies, many here in Southern California, if, if not most of them, um, that actually built into big businesses uh, and had very successful franchises. A couple things happened. There was a pricing war. They had a huge pricing war in the CD-ROM space and it just helped kill everybody. Um, the rise of the internet, none of them were prepared for. But then there was a roll up that went awry, which is I think really the deepest problem. There was a big roll up, I don't remember the exact machinations, but essentially rolled up into Mattel and, and it didn't work. Um, so I think there was a confluence of a series of events that put a taint on that whole sector, but I think the demand from the parents never went away. So that's our thesis. <laughs> It's, a, it's something you should do a business study on it, though. Yeah. So I teach at the Center of College of Design, and I was wondering to ask about the fab um, kind of game you have up there. Can you, take, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's still in the conceptual stages. Are you familiar with the fab lab yeah. phenomenon? Yeah. Um, so my brother's sort of the center of that fab lab okay. phenomenon. He, he, he runs the center for bits and atoms at MIT. Okay. Um, so I've been, as a family member, part of that. <laughs> Uh, the ecosystem, but it's been fascinating. Real, just briefly, what Fab Labs are, are they're community-based uh, workshops where you have, what they've developed is, is, is a set of software, CAD CAM software, design software, where you can design things in 3D and then essentially make them right there with a constellation of off-the-shelf machines. So it might be a laser cutter, a shop bot, any of the new family of 3D printers, uh, sign cutters, and it's actually really remarkable in a space as small as this area here, you can design and make almost anything, including things with form and function. And so my brother, who is a hardcore scientist but has become a social entrepreneur, um, has been through MIT helping to facilitate this movement. There's probably about 60 labs around the world, Afghanistan, Kenya, the North Pole, South Bronx, there's a bunch in the Midwest. And what's really interesting about the Fab Lab Network is because the software is consistent across all the labs, it's essentially an internet of bits and atoms. So we had a big conference in Pune, India, where all the Fab Labs came, and you could design a t-shirt in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, where there's a Fab Lab, and print it out in Nairobi, Kenya. And that's powerful. You can use local materials to invent local problems to local solutions. I mean, it's a powerful big vision. I think there should be a Fab Lab in every school. I think there should be one in every community. So it's been a total bottom-up thing. It's totally chaotic. You know, how do you keep the software sync? How do, you, how do these fab labs sustainable? It's, it's a very complex ecosystem. So we've been part of that. Um, we were actually looking at doing a fund to support investors that come out of it. Again, we couldn't quite come up with the investable thesis because a singular inve inventor in Afghanistan or Kenya is not a business. And, and, and there's just a fund can't work all over the world. And we just couldn't pull it off. But we really, there's something there. So what we decided to do is develop actually a game where we create a virtual fab lab. Uh, so kids who don't have access to a fab lab can play, design, and make stuff. But what's interesting is if we parameterize the data,
for some of the inventions, let's say a kite, you could design it and then you could actually have it made at your nearest fab lab. Or what I really want to do is, we, we, with a group called Sustainable South Bronx, we got a grant to put a fab lab in an 18-wheel truck and we drove it to the South Bronx, it's there now, it's really cool. What I want to do is have fab labs come into every community like the Scholastic Book Club. So you've been playing with the game, you've designed, you've built stuff, and then the fab lab rolls into town and you make it. So that's the vision. We're a ways away from executing that vision. <laughs> Alan, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you again. For